Swim listeners, do you have science you want to share? Microworld.org is the best place to post your microbiology-related news articles, pictures, videos, papers, and more. Sign up for a free account at microworld.org slash join and start reaching thousands of microbiology enthusiasts just like yourself. This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 86, recorded on August 28th, 2020. 14. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Yellow, and you are listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, howdy. How are you doing? I'm well as we reach the end of summer, huh? It is coming to an end. But it's beautiful out. Doing? Still weather is beautiful, but I understand you still are dry out there. Yeah, we have our terrible drought. Boy. It's really a problem. I don't know if this place is livable. I <laughs> wish we could send you some water. Yeah, please do. Can't do that. Also joining us today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. Midway across the country. Well, maybe not quite, right? Yeah, we're in the Eastern time zone. Yeah. Yeah. You 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 feel good about that, don't you? I do. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, they're just um, the news from Ann Arbor is they're back. They're back. Is it this week they started class? They move moved in today and tomorrow. They're moving in, so there are SUVs everywhere. Mm. Uh, so you said last time, or or maybe it was Kathy Spindler, that you don't start class till after Labor Day, right? I think that's true. She I'm said not that, teaching this fall, so I don't keep yeah, close she, track of that. She said that's so that the Michigan people can t- can go on vacation and up um, north, probably up north, and yep. uh, stimulate the economy. <laughs> <laughs> Pick until cherries until after Labor Day, because we have here already started college on Monday. Uh, my son started on Monday. Columbia started, so we don't have vacation allowances for Labor Day. Hmm. But I think it's not a bad idea because a lot of people like to do things on Labor Day weekend. Yeah, it's a family time sometimes. Yep, but the college kids are gone. Also joining us today from the medical college, wait a minute, the Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Welcome. Hello, everyone. I don't know why I couldn't remember your university. Well, for the first 170 years, we were the Medical College of South Carolina, and for the last... Uh, uh, 29, we were the Medical University of South Carolina. I guess that I'm still used to saying it the old way. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) I wasn't saying it 29 years ago, though. Beautiful day today, isn't it? It is. All around the country. Sure is. Yeah, it's really warm, and here it's very humid and a few puffy clouds in the sky. Just gorgeous day to do a podcast, I think. That's right. So let's uh, do that. We have a couple of papers for you today, but uh, to start out, Michael is going to bring us up to date on a recent um, action by the NIH. And this is a letter that I received in my inbox, and it came from Francis Collins, who's the director of the NIH, along with, uh, was co-authored by Lawrence Tabak, who is the principal deputy director of the NIH, and then Amy Patterson, who is the NIH's Associate Director for Biosecurity and Biosafety. And the tone of their letter is to uh, effectively address what's been going on in recent news reports that many of us have been made aware of, and that's safety practices at federal laboratories involving potentially lethal microbes such as avian flu, H5N1, anthrax, and the incident that made the news big time involving the discovery of a six-year-old smallpox file in an FDA lab that was then found to still be viable. I got to say, though, Michael, that wasn't a breach of security. That was just stuff stored that had been forgotten about. Yeah. All right. They lump it in with biosafety issues, but it's not because they were contained. They were immediately put in the right place and no nothing came of it. So this is not a an accident. It's not a lab accident. 
No, and and in fact, everybody followed the procedures to the letter right. associated with the smallpox, and I, I gave them kudos for for doing so. And that's the tone of this letter: is they reinforce that we as scientists can never be complacent in routine safety practices, and one mistake could have serious repercussions. And we're always worried about controls that they place on our ability to pursue science where it takes us. And so that's the tone of their letter. And what they have done is at NIH, they issued a guide notice to reinforce the message to everyone who receives an NIH grant or a grantee. They must meet all applicable federal, state, and local health and safety standards for research conduct. And I think anyone who receives an NIH grant is very attentive to those requirements. And what they do is they call specifically during the month of September that their labs, as well as all of our labs, should do the following. And that's principally re-examine your current policy and procedures for biosafety practices and oversight to see if they need to be modified to optimize their effectiveness. Conduct an inventory of your infectious agents in all labs to ensure that you and your institution has a record of which infectious agents are being used along with documentation that those agents are properly stored. And then reinforce biosafety training of researchers, lab support staff, and members of uh, the Institutional Biosafety Committee. And all those things are, are great pieces of advice, good common sense. And those of us who work with biosafety committees at our respective institutions know that that's what the committees are constantly doing. Many times people look at us on biosafety committees as the police, but we're just trying to make certain that all scientists can continue to pursue science wherever it may take us. And any undue regulatory burden that will occur as a result of um, a bad apple, uh, we want to prevent. And that's why I think the NIH is urging all of their grantee institutions to effectively make September National Biosafety Stewardship Month. So that's the tone of the letter. I think it's um, it's it's a right and measured response that they're having us do rather than going to the ex- extremes that they could have gone to. Thank you. Are you going to, after the recording, Michael, are you going to go off and check your inventory? Do you have anything dangerous in your freezer? Oh, I got all sorts of things. Really? I, all sorts of things. I, I have uh, listeria that I used to work on once upon a time. Hmm. And um, so the listeria is probably the most dangerous thing I have squirreled away in my freezer. But when I was looking at um, the secretion apparatus of, of bacteria, I, I had a large family of bacteria when we were screening to ask the question, do all bacteria have sec A? And the answer was yes, but we didn't know it at the time. And um, we actually discovered in um, the facultative of intracellular parasites that they have a second copy of sec A that can actually be deleted. So we screened a bunch of, of different microbes, uh, including the facultative of intracellular parasites, like of which Listeria is one. And we learned that they indeed did have that Michael? second copy. Yes. Before you go too far into all your research. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> I recommend you put off the inventory until next week in spirit of September being Biosafety Month. Enjoy the rest of August. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> I know exactly what's in my freezer. Polio. Yeah, there's a lot of polio. I have a great collection, actually, which eventually will have to be destroyed when the, the virus is eradicated. But um, really, I, and I inherited someone else's collection years ago who retired, someone from Berkeley. So quite interesting. All right, let's do a few papers, talk about research. And uh, we, the first paper is going to be about aphids. And before uh, you do that, Elio, I just want to read a really brief email from Suzanne. Uh, we talked about aphids not too long ago. I don't know what we were saying, but she writes, the best way to get rid of aphids in the garden The ants in my yard love to herd them onto my okra Mm -hmm. is a sharp stream of water from the hose. Aphids wash right off. They don't tend to come back right away either. (laughs) Drowning is a good solution. So if you have a small garden, that's fine. But of course, if you have acres and acres, that won't work. 
Okay, there you go, Elio. Tell us what this is about. All right. Let me tell you about the title of the paper first, which appeared in Current Biology this year. It's called Aphid Gene of Bacterial Origin Encodes a Protein Transported to an Obligate Endosymbiont. I'll explain what that means. And it's by a Japanese group, including Nakabachi, Ishida, Hongo, Okuma, and Miyagishima from various institutions in Japan. Before I go into the paper, let me make a comment. This is a two-page paper, and it's exceptionally well-written. Uh, it hit. It really hit me how in a short two pages, it's really more like one page because the second page is taken up by a large figure, how well you can explain something. Uh, this lays to rest any idea that people abroad who are not English, may not be English speakers primarily, have a difficult time writing scientific English. This is just a great example of how a group of people from Japan can do such a large, such a beautiful number. So I want to commend them for that. Anyhow, so the subject is uh, the uh, transfer of a gene of bacterial origin from the nucleus of the aphid to an endosymbiont. Let me frame this in a broader term. The subject here is endosymbiosis, and it deals at least tangentially, well, more than tangentially, with a great subject, namely the origin of eukaryotic cells by endosymbiosis. The notion that endosymbionts became mitochondria and chloroplasts is now widely accepted. It is not something that's a subject of debate. It's, it's part of what we all believe. And it's really a grand subject because this was one of the grandest events in the history of living things. I think it really ranks second in my mind to the origin of life. Life originated, and then sometime later, about a billion or two years later, eukaryotic cells arose by endosymbiosis, by one cell eating another cell, and the one that got eaten becoming an organelle in time. Okay, so I find this to be an incomparable event. It is magnificent in that in a single step, an awful lot of things happen. The acquisition of a whole bunch of biochemical pathways and the establishment of uh, eukaryotic cells as a consequence. So it's, it's grand. It's, and I think uh, what we know about it is limited because it happened a couple or so billion years ago, and it happens suddenly. We do not have intermediate steps. We don't know of intermediate steps. So here is a paper that deals with possible intermediate steps, with something that is maybe on the way of an endosymbiont becoming an organelle. So one of the things that happen is that the genes from the endosymbiont have been transferred en masse to the nucleus of the host cell. Okay? So, and then, of course, some of them become functional, some retain their functionality and make proteins, and some of these proteins go back to the endosymbiont. So there is a circle here. The gene goes from the symbiont to the nucleus. The nucleus, the nuclear genes encode for a protein, the protein goes back to the endosymbiont. So why this circle? Why this dance? You guys must have thought about this, and I bet you you have your own ideas. It's more Limited. efficient. It's more efficient, okay? That's certainly a good, good, a good way to How look at it. How do you know it's more efficient? I would just guess it's more efficient. <laughs> then you can throw away your own protein synthesis machinery and use the hosts. Well, but still, from the point of view of the cell, it costs the same, or it costs sure. an analogous amount. But uh, let me tell you what some smart people have been saying about this. This, by the way, is like all subjects in evolution, um, it is, in fact, uh, a topic that has been much considered and much has been said about it, and 
unfortunately, most of it is speculative. So when there is something concrete that looks like the event is happening in front of our eyes, it becomes important. But here are some of the reasons that are given. One of them, which I think is interesting, is that the mit- mitochondrion is a dangerous place for proteins, for macromolecules, because it's full of free radicals. So one way to handle it is to make the protein just come in at the right time not be made there and not be, okay. That's one thing. The other is that there's a thing called uh, Mueller's ratchet, which, is the, which says that the, if you have a non-sexual organism, it will accumulate deleterious mutations and eventually die out. Well, an endosymbiont is, or an organelle, if you wish, is in a place where there's no recombination taking place. There's no sex there. It is a place where deleterious mutations would accumulate at a disadvantage. But if you put the DNA in the nucleus, that's where recombination does take place. So you've taken care of the rat of Miller's ratchet. You re vigorate the endosymbiont by avoiding the uh, deleterious mutations that can take place in the genes involved. And then, and then on top of that, there's also a regulatory argument that if you put things in the nucleus, the expression of those genes will be under nuclear control and not under the control of the endosymbiont. I don't know. You can choose any or all of these possibilities, but that's a fact. The fact is that many of the symbionts, nuclei end up in, um, genes end up in the nucleus. And many are non-functional. Many are pseudogenes. Many don't have enough to go on. Oh, and another thing is that introducing genes from outside into the nucleus will alter the evolution of the nucleus. You can add promoters, regulatory sequences, things which affect the genome in the nucleus. So all these things all these things happen. It's, it's a big deal. It's a, it's a big event. So, that is true. Now, the, the, for the circuit to work, you, it requires that proteins made by now nuclear genes, which used to be bacterial genes, are capable of being transferred into the organelle or the endosymbiont, if you wish. And that requires uh, that there are uh, a specific, perhaps, or at least a dedicated system of transport. And sure enough, signal sequences are seen uh, at the amino terminus, which suggests that many of these proteins are capable of being transported. Well, they are. We know that. But how is the question? So, um, this has been known for organelles, mitochondria and plastids. They acquire proteins from genes which they have donated previously, previously being billions of years ago, to the nucleus. Uh, there are also the possibility for the transfer of genes which are not donated by that same endosymbiont, but by something else, by some other bacterium, somehow. So bacterial genes are found with some frequency now in eukaryotic genomes, and this is one, this is part of this subject. Okay. So, why is this exciting now? The reason for this paper being exciting is that we're talking not about the transfer of proteins from nuclear genes to an organelle, but from the the transfer of nuclear genes to an endosymbiont. Okay? The reason this is of some interest is because in the eyes of some, the distinction between the two, between organelles and endosymbionts, is mainly in our minds. Obviously, if organelles were endosymbionts, the difference is historical. But today, uh, you can, well, today you can sort of say, well, endosymbionts are found in um, only certain cells. Organelles tend to be found in all cells. It's not quite true for chloroplasts, but it's by and large true for mitochondria very rare exceptions. Um, organelles look like bacteria, look like, they don't really look like bacteria, they look like they have, were bacteria, but they have changed morphologies, etc. So you can say today you can make a distinction if you wish, but is that distinction valid? Now, so here now comes a paper which says that in fact you have this transfer into an endosymbiont. 
not an organelle. And therefore, this becomes interesting and uh, a possible example of, you know, work in the making. This is uh, possibly a case where an endosymbiont is on its way to become an organelle. So uh, what's involved here is that Buchnera is the name of the endosymbiont. It exists in aphids, which have a problem. They feed on plant sap, which is short on amino acids. And they, the aphids can only make certain amino acids and not all, just like we do. We need essential amino acids in our diet. Same for aphids. Or, but they don't get it in the diet. So instead, they have acquired an endosymbiotic bacterium, which can do just that. It makes some of the amino it makes the amino acids which the aphid needs, and feeds it. So if you were to treat aphids with an antibiotic, it gets rid of the endosymbiont. They would starve to death because they wouldn't have enough amino acids to make the make the protein. All right. So Alio, Alio, is yeah. it? Do we assume that at one point aphids could synthesize what they need and then by acquiring an endosymbiont? I would think so. They lost it? Yeah, I mm. would think so. They ate something else. They did not feed on plant sap. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would think that's very plausible. There are genes which are found in the uh, aphids and which are in the aphids nucleus and which look like bacterial genes by bioinformatic criteria. And some of these genes are found in the Buchnera and some are not. Anyhow, the, uh, one of these genes which has been found in the Buchnera is part of a group called the genes for rare lipoproteins. Now, rare lipoproteins are a family of proteins which are on the envelope of bacteria, quite widespread, and they play a role in who knows what all in pseudomonas, which is very different than the bugs we're talking about. One of them called RLPA4, please don't memorize that, <laughs> <laughs> is involved in cell shape, maintenance and in separation of daughter cells. So these are this this protein is important somehow in something that deals with cell structure, cell shape and so forth. Anyhow, they made uh, they raised antibodies against this protein and found that sure enough you find it in it is made exclusively in a specialized cell of the aphid called the bacteriocyte and the bacteriocyte is the place where the Buchnera, the endosymbionts, live. They only live there. They're not found spread out in the aphid. They're only found in a specific cell. The interesting thing is that this protein, which is encoded in the nucleus, first of all, it is not of Buchnera origin. Buchneras are gamma protein. No, they're alpha proteobacteria. It's a group of bacteria. And uh, the protein comes from a gamma proteobacterium, which is a very different group. So this gene was acquired somehow from some gamma proteobacterium, became part of the nucleus, and now it donates its protein to an alpha proteobacterium. So there's a circle here. So it tells you that <clears throat> nature is that way. You can make do with bits and pieces in a variety of uh, clever ways. All right. Now, the an interesting part, this is now a side issue, but let me tell you, so the, the question is, what does this protein do for the Buchnera? And nobody knows. However, the protein is only found in what are known as mature bacteriocytes. Bacteriocytes, obviously, are made in a baby aphid, and they start out as young bacteriocytes, and as the animal uh, ages, it becomes a mature bacteriocyte. And the, you only find this protein in the mature ones. So what gives? Well, you can, you can hope for many explanations, but one of them is that the role of these proteins has something to do with what mature bacteriocytes are all about, namely the transfer of the Buchnera to progeny. So maybe there's a hint 
just by the localization of this protein in the mature and not in the immature endosymbionts, uh, that this may have something to do with with the um, this may have something to do with the function of this protein somehow in the handing over of the buchnera. Elia, do we know if RLPA15 is essential for buchnera? It seems to be. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's been essential. Looked at. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's, yeah, it's not. Uh, yeah. Even though the function of the protein's not known, that data shows that there's regulation, there's specificity, that it's yeah. imported specifically into one compartment but not another. Very true. Of Very the good. cell. Yeah. Yeah. So what's new about this paper is that it, this this property of transferring the protein which has a role, which actually works somehow, is a characteristic of organelles. And with one exception I won't talk about, as an amoeba, it is not known to take place in endosymbionts. So now it takes place in endosymbionts. And in a commentary which accompanies this paper by um, McCutcheon and Keeling, who are two people very much in the know of endosymbiosis and, or, and organ organellogenesis, they have a very lovely commentary. And I want to read a sentence of or two from their commentary. Organelles were discovered first, have been studied for decades, and their bacterial origins dominated discussion about endosymbiosis and evolution for many years. They enjoy a status apart from other biological entities. Derived from bacteria, but so different as to be given their own name. But the list of their unique characteristics is shrinking. Stable endosymbiosis promote extensive genome reduction in the symbiont. Horizontal gene transfer from various sources to the host genome to maintain symbiont function. And now the targeting of protein products from host to symbiont has ever been even been found. This make, this is the point now, this make clean separation of endosymbionts from organelles more difficult to see, prompting us not to look for the point when a symbiont becomes an organelle, but rather to ask, is there really anything so special about organelles? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So there. And part of their argument was based on um, not only fluorescence microscopy, but also um, electron microscopy, which is even more challenging because they then did immunolocalization. So they had That's to right. fix and preserve the structure, uh, yeah. but not damage the antigen so that the antibody would still uh, recognize it. And then you can visualize it by using um, gold That's particles. Right. So that was a, a real challenge um, that I learned from um, Atsushi Nakabachi, who's the uh, first author on this paper, who I had uh, was able to correspond with and learn a little bit more about his background. Oh, tell so, us. He's an associate professor at um, Tohashi University of Technology, but he works now in an institute which has a great name, the Electronics Inspired Interdisciplinary <laughs> Research Institute. Mm -hmm. oh so this was founded in 2010, and their mission is to leverage the established strength they have in electronics technology and to apply it to advanced research on in life sciences, medical care, Ooh. agriculture sciences, environmental sciences. Good so, for them. Yeah, so that's where he works. He has been fascinated by insect microbe symbiosis for, for more than 20 years now. He started working on the aphid Bucknera symbiosis with um, Dr. Hajima Ishikawa at the University of Tokyo, where he earned his PhD. And then he um, did postdoctoral research at um, Riken, which is a um, a private research foundation that was originally founded in Tokyo in 1917, but it's now um, expanded to this network of nine research centers and institutes uh -huh. all across Japan. Wasn't it originally meant to study pathogenic bacteria mainly? I don't know. I don't I know. So. Um, I know we get transgenic mice um, from them, but uh -huh. it's been really important. But So he also um, did a, um, uh, he was a research associate with Nancy Moran um, at the University of Arizona in 2006 and seven, and, and the two of them have co-authored four research articles. So some of our listeners may be familiar with her work as well. Uh, and by the way, been, Nancy has moved from there to Yale and now to Texas. That's right. Mm. Yeah, she's um, in demand. <laughs> Moranella, right? A real thought leader. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's another one of these endosymbionts named after her, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. Moranella, mm. right. 
So he's been an associate professor at um, Tohuhashi University of Technology since 2011, and there he uh, is interested in symbiosis, interactions between organisms, um, genome evolution, pest control, etc. So there you have it. Nice. Thank you. So, Elio, would you care to think about how, what order did this happen in? Did, um, <laughs> did the genes randomly become taken up? So the, the origin of, the, uh, of this particular gene. So there were a dozen genes that were transferred from another host, right? Did they, right. Did they get just randomly incorporated and then later some selection was applied that made them functional, do you think? You know, this is really a good question. I, I did not look it up. I don't know where they're located on the, on the genome of the aphid. Yeah. Are they synthetic? That is, are they next to each other? I have no idea. So that would be a hint. If, if you knew where on the genome they're located, are they together or are they separate? I don't know. Hmm. I really or it could be so. something as simple as codon bias where the hmm. gamma proteobacter genes are more efficiently translated and right. the uh, aphid made the decision from fitness that it could get something from the bacteria site uh, at the same time uh, being able to eliminate the genes that the bacteria site is actually carrying along or the endosymbiote, if you will, carrying along and the gamma proteobacter, right. which, you know, are things like uh, the Enterobacteriaceae, the Vibrios, and the Pseudomonas, mm. uh, it could just pick them up from um, the – if they're eating sugar water, uh, those microbes will contaminate sugar water quite commonly and they may have just – that gene may be older. So it, it, it may be interesting to look at the evolution of that particular uh, sure. product yeah. in order to figure yeah. out if the chicken or the egg came first. What came first was – was it the – uh, gamma mm -hmm. proteobacter gene, or was it the endosymbiote? So my guess would be, and this is totally a guess, these, the aphids are at another time, they're different, they're eating, as Elio said earlier, something else that provides them with everything they need. Somehow they acquire these genes, and then... From uh, the gamma. From the gamma, maybe they ingested something that had it in it. Right. Uh, and then they end up going to the, the plant and, and eating sap and the ones that have the genes survive yeah. uh, and they have now found a new niche into which they expand and mm -hmm. forget about steak and potatoes you know <laughs> <laughs> but, now we're just eating sugar water but anyway that's I love thinking about the order of these things happening because we don't know sure. and uh, yeah. maybe someday when we have more data we'll have a better indication. It's really interesting. I would think so. I would think so. By the way, uh, one one last point. Mm -hmm. uh, left behind in the endosymbiont are still some genes. Like mitochondria have genes and it's for organelles. Chloroplasts have quite a few genes. So what? I, what? how are they selected? I know that people have been speculating about that. I just don't happen to know anything about it. Uh, why is there not a massive transfer of all the genes? Uh, there are organelles, the hydrogenosomes, which have no DNA, and apparently all their, they were apparently also acquired by endosymbiosis, and all the genes have ended up in the nucleus. So how come some do, some don't? Uh, it's kind of strange. So any, I'm any. Any, any of you know the answer you, to that? So you're talking about the genes that Buchnera, in this case, retain? Yeah. How yeah. come, how, you know, how come are there, are there some genes left in Buchnera? Well, don't they provide uh, amino acids for the aphid? So well, they're, bio, why, they're, sure, they're but, biosynthetic genes, right? But they uh, might work I've, just as well in the nucleus is what Elias suggests. could suggest. be in the nucleus as well. Yeah, I think that's so a Talmudic I, question I for, for it's a small things considered. I think, I think, <laughs> well, if, if our order is right, if, at some point the aphid had those genes, right? Right. And and, and right. then it lost them because the Buchnera was providing them. And what, so what would be that advantage? Yeah, that's a good question. Why didn't aphids keep them and Buchnera becomes just a shell? It could be random and then yeah. locked in by fitness 
advantages. Yes, absolutely. More, more is known, folks. I, I, let, let's admit our ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> you think someone knows the answer? So, somebody, somebody has speculated about. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. But there, we'll get a letter. They're we'll possibly letter. equally uh, speculating. Who knows? Great. Thank you, Elio. Oh, my pleasure. I like these. You you really like these endosymbiont stories, oh, don't you? I'm big on that. If I had to start over, I think I'd become an insect microbiologist. <laughs> I think that, that's so cool. <laughs> yep. We know because you, you've done a few of them now. Yeah. Uh, numbers 69, 74, and 78 TWIM episodes. Wow. <laughs> Those are all... Do, do you, were they uh, a- I didn't double check whether Elio had uh, led the discussion. But. I know you've done an aphid before, and you've also done some of the... What are they? Mealy bugs or pill bugs? Mealy bugs. Mealy bugs. And then one was microbes to human. Yes. Yep. The genome paper. It's an interesting story. All right. Uh, let's move on to our second presentation, which Michael will do for us. And I'll be discussing a review essay that appeared in the journal Bioessays under the category in the journal called Prospects and an Overview. And the reason I, I, I picked this article is, is um, I got turned on to it by a New York Times post by Carl Zimmer. Um, but I'll give you their title first and then I'll give you Carl's title. So their title is, Is Eating Behavior Manipulated by the Gastrointestinal Microbiota? Evolutionary Pressures and Potential Mechanisms. And this particular paper was authored by Joe Alcott, Carl O'Malley and Athena Actipus. And they are collectively from the Department of Emergency Medicine at New Mexico, uh, the Department of Psychology, the Department of Surgery, and the Institute of Advanced Study at UCSF and the University of uh, Advanced Study in Berlin. And Carl's title, Carl Zimmer, who writes for the New York Times, is was um, our microbiome may be looking out for itself. So both articles had me at the title. And as some of you may know, I've been following this emerging field, which I refer to as microbial endocrinology, that is being advanced by many. But it was principally after hearing Mark Light talk at a general meeting symposium at ASM that yeah. I became a follower of this field. And then the late Ed Baelish, who joined my department when he retired from the University of Wisconsin. And Ed was a great pioneer of the use of notobiotic animals. So between listening to Mark Light and then looking at um, his blog post on small things considered, um, I, I became a, a follower of of, of this field. And um, well before the days when everybody was working on the microbiome. And so what these authors did is they, they laid out the paper through a series of short paragraphs that actually delineate the evidence that they're trying to get you to follow along. So when they propose uh, their thesis statement for their um, essay, you you sort of are following along and, and believing them. So I'm going to give you what their uh, thesis statement is, and that is microbes in the gastrointestinal tract are under selective pressure to manipulate host eating behavior. And I, I think that's why it got all the press because bacteria manipulating host eating behavior eating behavior, and it was simply to increase their fitness, sometimes at the expense of the host. And as they go on in their abstract, they tell us that the microbes may be able to accomplish this by using two particular strategies. And the first is to generate cravings for foods that the microbes specialize on their mineralization or consumption, and at, or that suppress their competitors uh, through end products or by inducing dysphoria, which means that the host is going to feel bad until we eat foods that enhance their, their fitness. And 
When I first proposed that we discuss this paper on TWIM, I, I phrased it as a, as a question because I didn't know whether or not it was, was TWIMable. And so uh, I said, well, how am I going to do this? How am I going to present this, this review paper, which summarizes a lot of literature in a very short space? And as you listen to me, as I try to unfold the story, Keep in the back of your mind the following questions. How do we know that the data that they're talking about are indeed addressing the specific question? How did the, the authors that they're quoting show their particular experiments were doing what they were supposed to do? What are the controls? And this is very important. And think about how big of a sample size you're going to need in order to prove a particular point. And uh, finally, uh, I don't know about your places, but at my place, every seminar you go to these days seems to have someone talking about the microbiome, whether it be in an immunological seminar or whether it be in something as um, off-topic as cell biology and anatomy. They're all getting on the microbiome bandwagon. So again, the approach of these authors was to review several pro- potential mechanisms. And what they did is they started off by giving us the stem. The evolutionary contact conflict between host and microbe leads to host manipulation. And this conflict is perceived to exist over resource acquisition and resource allocation. We all know that the, the gut has an incredible amount of microbial diversity. And in fact, the, the number that's bandied about in, in the lay literature is that the microbial genome in our guts outnumbers our genes by a factor of 100. And so as you begin to think about these things, and the, the authors introduced me to two specific genetic conditions that I hadn't heard of simply because I'm a microbiologist and, and not a pediatrician. And that was Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome and Prader-Willi syndrome, where both conditions result in an altered appetite and differences in how infants suckle that are specifically driven by the overexpression of genes from either the father, which is the Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, or the mother, which is the Prader Will's Willie syndrome. And so the parental genes are hypothesis to drive increased demands for extracting resources from the mother. And the maternally imprinted genes are designed to resist this particular action. And so there's genetic evidence that this particular thing is, is out there. So then they me- make their leap and they propose the following. They, they s- simply argue that the metagenomic conflict between the host and the microbiome can, can be considered an extension of this genetic conflict, if you will, from the paternal and maternal that they're drawing the analogy to, and that the genes that affect the physiology and behavior of the host organism potentially alter the host eating behavior in ways that the, will then benefit microbial fitness. So then they take us through the data that's already out in the literature. And we've discussed some of this data on TWIM before. The first piece of data out there that I think many of you already are familiar with is that there is selective influence on, of diet on, on the microbiota. And this is pretty well known. Prevotella grows best on carbs. We've talked about this in the past on TWIM. Dietary fiber provides a competitive advantage to bifidobacter. In other words, an apple a day keeps the doctor away because we recognize that bifidobacter is one of these good bacteria and it thrives on fiber. Members of the bacteroidates have a substrate preference for certain fats. And finally, that mucin-degrading bacteria such as Echermansia mucinophilia thrived on secreted carbohydrates that are provided by host cells. And then, of course, we discussed the paper on TWIM specifically about selecting out organisms in our gut that can 
that can actually degrade chitin, which is associated with seaweed. And humans and the bacteria in our gut normally don't degrade seaweed. Yet, if you consume a lot of sushi, you, you can then, of course, begin to degrade seaweed. So the interesting thing about this paper is they give you seminal studies that you can actually go and ask yourself the question, do I believe it? And can I design experiments? And so the next piece of data that they provide to us under the subheading, microbes can manipulate host behavior. This is where they introduce the wonder and where I think the most skepticism is. And they alert the reader that this is all circumstantial evidence between cravings and composition of gut flora. And the way they tease this is, again, these are very interesting points that they're bringing up is they they introduce individuals who are chocolate desiring and chocolate indifferent have different microbial metabolites in their urine. So going back to how do you know and how do you show, well, you can, of course, measure metabolites in urine. We have good mass spec technology that we can do that. And this is in, in spite of the two individuals, the indifferent and the chocolate desiring, eating the same or identical diets. So it, it's, again, interesting. But again, how do you know? What are the p-values? How big is the population that's going into it? Michael, how, ma- how many people have cravings? Do we have any idea? No. And that's what I was – this is one of the criticisms that uh, Michelle raised in her email to me yesterday is that you know she's got some really crackerjack scientists at Michigan who are working on, on the microbiome, Pat Schloss and Vince Young. And um, they were very cautious and, and skeptical about this. Um, I mean, and I, I, the, of us here on the call, do, do any of us crave chocolate? I don't. I don't. I love chocolate, but I don't crave yeah. it. Yeah, really? I don't either. I just wonder what percentage of the population. And uh, how, how on earth can you really measure it? I know they go into it, but yeah, you know, this right. seems absurd to even try to measure <laughs> something which is as, as subjective as that. And then to, to you know, pull out cause and effect. I don't see how anybody can do that. And in fact, yeah. in, in a mouse model, how could you even measure chocolate craving, right? Because that's what you'd yeah. have to do, the manipulating. You'd have to do something else. So it seems to me that this is, you know. It, and, <laughs> but it's it's provocative because, you know, these are the sorts of reviews that get people to thinking to try to figure out how to design it. And when they introduce the concept that microbes can influence mood, this is where they talk about lactobacillus casei. And, and I, I did some work in the late 90s on looking at various uh, lactobacilli in, in whole plant corn silage, uh, looking at how those microbes that would ensile the forage could actually cause weight gain in animals fed that ensiled material. And, you know, there are uh, 20,000 different strains of lactobacillus plantarum all doing a little bit something different. Hmm. And... Huh. That they many, go on, huh? <laughs> yeah, that many that have been characterized, 20,000 different ones that are in culture collections. Wow. And it's principally because of the metabolic diversity and the end products that these things to, to do. And, and this is where they offer us insight into how mechanistically things might be working. They introduce the evidence where mice are fed lactobacillus rhamnos, which it reduces the concentration of stress-induced corticosteroid hormone levels in the mouse and makes them more determined or dogged, as they said, in that the raminose fed mice swim for longer periods of time in a glass cylinder filled with water. And so they're able to measure the corticosteroids. And uh, when they sever the vagus nerve, the nerve responsible for communicating those neurotrophic signals that mark light talks about, and Ed Baelish was always talking with me about, sever the vagus nerve, which is central in behavior modification from the gut, because it's truly the trunk line or major piece of fiber, if you will, that serves to connect the 100 million neurons 
of the enteric nervous system from the gut to the brain. And most folks don't know that the enteric nervous system is as complex as the spinal cord. And this um, vagus nerve ties back into the base of the brain at the medulla. And these enteric nerves in our gut actually have receptors that react to the presence of particular bacteria and their metabolites. So that's something that you can physically measure. You can isolate the receptor, you can clone the receptor, and you can do the plus and minus uh, experiments, isolating various bacteria, putting bacteria into the system, seeing what those receptors do. And similarly, you can harvest the metabolites out. And the metabolites that most folks are looking at are these short-chain fatty acids. And we've already discussed some of the primary literature about butyrate and the whole issue of butyrate. And, you know, they they also uh, bring up the paper that demonstrates that the vagus nerve actually regulates eating behaviors and body mass. And one of the interesting factoids that uh, I personally have experienced is my niece was a competitive gymnast in college and she damaged her or bruised her vagus nerve uh, as a consequence of uneven parallel bars. And she had dysphoria. She didn't want to eat. She felt lousy. And when she presented to the healthcare system, they thought she was anorexic. And she wasn't anorexic. She just had bruised her her vagus nerve and it it really screwed up her ability to eat and actually um, the microbes that changed and she was just a mess and it took her about two and a half years to just get back on track. How did and, do, do you know that, that her microbes changed, yeah. Michael? Yes. How? Uh, she went to Michigan of all places <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they characterized what was going on with her. They did stool samples, and her stool was different. Did they have a before and after sample? They didn't have a before, but they have now a after sample when she's eating uh, regularly again. Yeah. But yeah. they they did many different scopes, and they pulled bugs out from her, and they characterized what was going on with her gut. I'll and, agree that, that that story is consistent, but cause and effect is really difficult uh, to no, establish. No, it's, right? it's, it's absolutely, you know, I, I was really skeptical when this happened about, this was before the days of, of cheap sequencing. So this was back probably now eight years ago. And so, and, the, and these authors then go on to introduce us to the inconsolable crying from an infant with colic where they suggest that changes in gut microbiota, including reductions to overall diversity, increase the density of proteobacter and decrease numbers of of bacteroides compared to controls. And operationally, again, I'm not a pediatrician, so I had to look this up. Colic is operationally defined as uh, under the rule of threes. Uh, a colically infant will often cry in more than three hours a day for three days a week for three weeks or longer. And this process um, typically starts with babies at the beginning of about three weeks of age. It peaks somewhere between four and six and generally ends by week 12. So here the central hypothesis with the bugs in the gut controlling the colic because there's no mechanistic explanation for colic. Here the hypothesis is that the behavior of the parent is trying to console the child, which is often uh, done by feeding. And the supposition is that the colic behavior results in energy delivery to the infant and hence greater access to nutrition. And this is, again, where I think it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Seems like a long shot to me. It, it yep. does. It, <laughs> I, it, and I'm it, worried about the hype that this can engender. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, there and, is, and this there is, is such a thing as difficult science. Yeah. And, and this is difficult science. I don't admire the, I admire the people for trying to do it because they're really tackling projects that are almost impossible to design properly. It's, it, it, I'm not sure it can be done. And no, there's no I don't mouse know what model. it takes. And I so I, I, I'm, yeah. I admire yeah. him for trying. <laughs> That's right. But, 
rather them than me is all I can say. <laughs> well, that's that's why I picked this paper is because I think to the new person to a field and and the microbiome is being thrown at everything today. Right. And the, they some is they right go on. And some is not. <laughs> and and it's sometimes it's not. It and and they go and we on. We don't know which part it is. And one of the. Um, I think one of the uh, recent nature papers out there is a topic of of their next discussion, and and that's particularly pain pain perception and bacterial virulence. And yeah, well. here, bacteria produce virulent toxins when conditions become limiting. Simple sugars and other nutrients regulate virulence and growth. Here, I immediately thought of the lac operon and dioxic growth that we teach to every medical student or entering microbiologists. And then the commensals in our gut, they argue, can directly injure our intestinal epithelium when certain nutrients are limiting or absent, raising the possibility that the microbes manipular, manipulate our behavior through pain signaling. And so that uh, then prompted me to go hunt down the nature paper, which we don't have enough time to uh, to get into, and that may be worth a, a TWIM discussion because that's recently uh, come out. We did do a paper on how bacteria right, induce pain. Number by, 77. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Number seven. Michelle's I'm the librarian a, today. Well, thank you. Uh, I was. I meant to look that up, but, you know, it's it, it goes into, they have one figure in this entire review article. And, and the figure is actually very interesting because what it does is it gives you the reference list to the references you need to read in order to assess. For example, they have one, vagus nerve interruption leads to weight loss. And there's two papers that particularly establish that. And negative mood induced by toxins, there's three manuscripts associated with that, may increase eating. And, you know, looking at the evidence that they have laid before us, they and, – and it goes on for, for nine other specific areas that I'm not going to uh, take you all through. In the next area of the paper, they actually propose experiments, which I think are – it gets back to Elio's point of, of how do you do these experiments. So the first experiments that they oh, – Go ahead, Elio. Well, let's not get into too much detail because this can go on forever. I think that the point is well made that this is tough stuff. I yeah. think we, we have to admire them for trying. And it's just plain tough stuff. Well, it's, it's also the case that there are a lot of really exciting ideas out there. Yep. But what we don't have are human studies that have, um, you know, controlled in a controlled fashion, uh, collected the data to see if we can manipulate the human microbiome, if it then right. uh, remains stably in a new, with a new um, diversity, et cetera. So I think the value of this essay is it, it really points to um, the potential for this research um, and how much work needs to be done to test these really exciting ideas. Right. And that's effectively why I, I selected it because it points to the liter the primary literature that is beginning to uncover the rock and show us that there's something interesting. Good. But, I'm glad you did. So yeah. uh, that I think I'll stop there. <laughs> I, yeah. think, I think so. Yeah, I, I mean, we I, can go on forever. Yeah, this. this is the points that have been made. And I think it's really important to point out that you know a lot of work on the microbiome has been characterizing the populations by sequencing and now we and making associations but now you have to start doing experiments and like some of the ones that are suggested in this paper yep and when we go through the um emails are you going to refer uh Vincent to the the um comment in nature yes in fact Great. let me do that that follows right right at the top naturally. here uh, this was sent by Trudy who wrote dear, dear Twimmers I just ran across this commentary in nature and thought you might find it of interest since many of your discussions involve the microbiome microbiota and Trudy uh, links to a very nice paper in nature called microbiology microbiome science needs a healthy dose of skepticism by William how do you pronounce his last name I don't know Hanedge 
Hanage, H-A-N-A-G-E. And the subtitle is, To Guard Against Hype, Those Interpreting Research on the Body's Microscopic Community Should Ask Five Questions. So these are great. Five questions. Can experiments detect differences that matter? Does the study show causation or just correlation? What is the mechanism? How much do experiments reflect reality, which we've Mm -hmm. talked about? Could anything else explain the results? These are really, Amen. and he goes through why these are important for these kinds of studies. So, great article, and thanks for sending that to us because it's perfect for our discussion here. And today. it came out on August twentieth. Yeah, right. that's right. All right, a couple of other emails I'd like to read. One is from John. He writes while discussing the Siberian doomsday virus, TWIM seventy four at fifty minutes. Michael wonders how the virus survived cosmic rays. The only charged. Cosmic ray particles that can penetrate 30 meters of rock or ice are muons. Protons and electrons are absorbed. I estimate half of muons get through, resulting in a dose of about 1 milli SVs per year. Sievert. Sieverts per year. I knew you would know that. (laughs) Over 30,000 years, the virus accumulates a dose around 30 sieverts. It takes 1,000 sieverts or more to inactivate a virus. This value is similar for RNA, small DNA, and large DNA viruses. And he gives a reference for that. So 30 sieverts should just make the virus angry and ready to go on a (laughs) rampage. Or maybe I'm thinking of the Hulk. Radiation is even less effective on viruses in ice. The virus irradiation paper says so. And I had independently predicted the effect because most DNA damage is caused indirectly by hydroxyl radicals, which are less mobile in ice. I look forward to papers about 300,000-year-old viruses. (laughs) Angry viruses. <laughs> this was a fantastic comment because first it goes to the argument that biology does require quantitation. And here we we know how many sieverts it takes to inactivate viruses. And I, I just love this, this particular – uh, nice. I, I mean it's fantastic. Yeah, it's a good job. Uh, The next one is from Jeffrey, who writes, Doctors, what a funny coincidence. I heard a letter of mine read in episode 78. Then two letters later, you read Matt's letter. The coincidence is that I asked almost exactly Matt's question to my allergist not two months before you read it on your podcast. My doctor didn't think that nasal mucosal colonization was a thing, so a transplant was unlikely to have any real effect. I don't think that he noticed my Vulcan-like raised eyebrow at that answer, and we went on with the visit. I will be sending him a link to the letter and the episode of the podcast. If he decides to test an off-label use of mucosal biota on me, then I'll try to let you know how it works. (laughs) Thank you for reading both of my letters, and thanks for the encouragement. And now a third, Jeffrey, a third letter read today. That's right. Yeah, Jeffrey's prolific. Don writes, while reading Small Things Considered, it was mentioned that chloroform was used to sterilize the soil in an experiment on exoenzymes. From behind the paywall, I was unable to find vapor concentrations, but wondered if this could be used in the treatment of sepsis. Chloroform was used as a general anesthetic, but with some cardiotoxicity. Is there any data on using chloroform to treat sepsis in lab animals? I suppose there would be some concern about massive demise of the bacteria triggering a cytokine storm like the Hertzheimer reaction when syphilis was first treated with penicillin. Your podcasts are wonderful and do so much to foster scientific literacy. Thanks again. And Don is a doctor, a physician, an MD. Anybody know anything about chloroform well, here? I don't, but I would, I would put my money on the fact that chloroform is extraordinarily toxic. Yeah. You know, it's not, if you put it in soil, it doesn't matter. But you put it in people, it's, it's going to kill them before it does anything to the bacteria. Yeah, I would guess, yeah. Yeah, and the livers and the liver toxicity associated sure. with the Tissue damage. Yeah. Oh. All right. Uh, next one is from Robin who writes, Tuberculosis. Pott's disease is tuberculosis of the spine causing vertebral body collapse in kyphosis. Kyphosis is curved convexity backwards as in the Hebrew kefufa, referring to non-terminal forms of the letters. And then you send some Hebrew letters. Anyone making a decision for respiratory isolation for tuberculosis should have been trained at least once to to competence in the performance of a Zeal-Nielsen stain. While a negative result does not change a clinical decision to 
commence respiratory oscillation, a positive result instantly makes a whopping difference in the clinical picture. Mm -hmm. There are things every physician should have learned to do, including a manual CBC in a Wintrobe hemocytometer, a spun hematocrit, a right stain, a silver stallion sigmoidoscopy, a lumbar puncture, endotracheal intubation, etc. These are as basic as learning to ride a bicycle is for most people. Surprisingly, most hospital labs do not even have the reagents for the zeal Nielsen stain at hand. They should have single-use aliquots of the reagents in a freezer so that even if the technician cannot do the stain, the physician caring for the patient should do it. And finally, oxygen dissociates from hemoglobin at various partial pressures. Fetal hemoglobin hones on to oxygen more avidly than in the adult because it has a lot less oxygen around. Deep sea fish hemoglobin is a champion in this regard. <laughs> it's great. Mm. I think we mentioned all these things at one point yeah. or another, and Robin uh, is always on hand to straighten us out. And one more from Rebecca. Hello, Twim Team. I am a medical laboratory scientist, and I work in microbiology at a small hospital in Michigan. Yay. Boy, Michigan <laughs> comes up often. All the time. I guess we all should Is go live in Michigan. Is there another state in the union? <laughs> no, apparently not. <laughs> I also teach clinical diagnostic microbiology at a community college to future medical laboratory technicians which is the associate degree level of hospital laboratory bench technicians. I'm already thinking of ways to incorporate some of your discussions of microbiology for my students. I will especially recommend episode 52, which can show the students how far they really can take their careers. Was that our episode on clinical? I'm afraid I didn't look that one up. I think it was clinical <laughs> microbiology. With Alan Joe, I yes. think. I've been listening to TWIM since June 2014 and have just completed episode 66. I have fairly long drive to work, and I am also in the habit of listening to books and podcasts while I am working alone on weekends, which is how I have gotten so far. As I was listening to episode 66 discussion of C. diff, I really had to laugh at how you found the wording, quote, forms to the shape of the container, unquote, so funny. That is the exact criteria we use here at the hospital to determine whether or not a stool sample is suitable for C. diff testing. When I got to work, I found the episode online and had my coworker listen to this part of the discussion. We both thought the TWIM team would really get a kick out of this too. If there is a stool sample that a tech is unsure whether it is diarrhea or not, a stick test is performed. A wooden applicator stick is put into the stool about three quarters of an inch. The container is tilted 45 degrees. If the applicator stick falls at an angle greater than or equal to 90 degrees, then the stool sample is suitable for testing. <laughs> this, is the wow. way, this is the way it is stated in our it's procedure manual. It is hard to imagine, but we get a variety of stool samples, and sometimes it's hard to determine if testing should be performed, which is why the criteria is defined in this way. I can't wait to hear you have a good laugh at the expense of our stick test. I like it. It's uh, cheap, it's quick, and it's uh, definitive. Yeah. I want to know what they call it. The stick test, I guess. Right? Because they use a wooden stick. Yeah. Ah, that's great. I love it. Keep up the good work. I love listening to this podcast. Once I get caught up on TWIM, I'm going to start TWIP and then TWIV. I'm saving virology for last because it has the most episodes and it is the subject I know the least about, but I'm looking forward to knowing more. Thank you again for all the hard work and effort that goes into creating these podcasts. They are truly a benefit to the scientific community and the general population. Oh, nice. So episode uh, 52 was Clinical Microbiology with Ellen Jo Barron right. that you all did in March of 2013. Yep. Mm -hmm. You good. went to visit a clinical microbiology lab. and Yeah, Elio, you had visited one, right? That's right. I wrote yeah. about it. The I thought it was a yeah. phenomenal experience. So Rebecca... And needed, people needed to know about it. Is, after Rebecca's name, she has MLS and ASCP. So what does that mean? Medical laboratory something? Medical laboratory scientists. And ASCP? Is the board certification for, for that group. Well, got it. And she probably knows less about virology because there are just fewer lab tests, right? In the, in the clinical microbiology labs? But they're becoming PCR-based. Yeah, basically. Right, yeah, now they are. Yeah, they used to be cell, you know, cell culture isolation and now right. mainly PCR. And Ellen Joe talked a little bit about that as well, yeah. But, you know, not every hospital will have a virology lab component, right? Depends on right. the size. But also. you don't have all these cool differential uh, media where you can look at colonies no, on a plate. And we don't. But, we, but, but they can do plaque assays. Yes, Michelle, right. we have other cool things. 
Yes, you do. But <laughs> traditionally, there was just less. Yeah, and I think tests, uh, Ellen Joe so. said you, there's much less visual, right? right? You don't get to look at all these colonies and colors and so forth. That's absolutely right. All right, that'll do it for TWIM86. You can find it at iTunes and also at microbeworld.org slash TWIM. And we love getting your questions and comments. We love hearing how excited you are about microbiology. So tell us, send emails to twim at twiv.tv. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. My pleasure. The state of Michigan. Wow. What number (laughs) in the union was that? Do you know? I don't know. It wasn't 13. (laughs) I don't think don't so. Don't ask her. She'll tell you number one. <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for her to say that. It would be, I, would, I would expect it, yes. It would be fine. Elio Schechter, is it Small Things Considered? Thank you, Elio. Oh, thank you. I had a lot of fun. And Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone. And that's in Charleston, right? That's in Charleston, South Carolina, and we were the eighth state in the union, uh. and Michigan was the 26th state in the union. Oh, yeah, you go. Thank you for Whoa. that. <laughs> Wonderful. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM, and in particular, Chris Kandian and Ray Ortega for their technical help. And speaking of ASM and their support, they have been great supporters of TWIV as well. And in fact, just Tuesday, we did our 300th episode of TWIV at the headquarters of the American Society for Microbiology. I'd love to hear how that went. Was there a good audience? And Yeah, we did it in this, in this as you know, the Sam Kaplan boardroom. You're probably right? familiar with that. It was full. There were, I don't know, 80 people in there. They had put rows of chairs in. And we had a great time, and uh, the, the audience seemed to love it. And uh, we, at the end, we threw out fluffy viruses to the audience. Were there any injuries? <laughs> yeah, I hit a woman in the face, unfortunately. <laughs> but she didn't get infected. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's hard to throw things in that room. The ceiling is low. You need yeah. a big auditorium where you can fire f- T-shirts into the audience. But anyway, I want to thank ASM for all of their support of all the podcasts over the years. It's great. To help us uh, spread the word. Congratulations on your landmark 300. That's Thank great. Thank you. Thank you for I, I just feel so sorry for Rebecca, who has to catch up by listening to all 300 episodes. No, she can work back, you know. And Yeah. But they don't go out of date. That's the thing. They're no, just, they don't. They're, they're just still right. So enjoy. The music you hear on TWIM at the beginning and the end is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find all his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.